Our physical region for today is the Central Plains. And as we talked about yesterday, there are four physical regions in Texas. The coastal plains, the mountains and basins, and the Great Plains, which we talked about yesterday. So before we get into the central plains of Texas, or the interior plains, as some geographers refer to it, let's look at uh, the Texas landscape in its entirety. The saying goes that everything's bigger in Texas, and for many people that is true, but it's especially true when you look at one thing in particular, the state's size. Drive for hours, and you'll still be in one region of Texas. It takes more than a full day to drive across the state's breadth. With such size, however, Texas certainly boasts a great range of landscapes. It is a place more than one billion years in the making, and each region has a story to tell. So what can be said about the geology of Texas? For one thing, one side of the state is not like the other, whether it's north, south, west, or east. Different landscapes, different rocks, and even different climates are at each corner of the state. As you can see, there are a lot of colors, labels, and information in general to take in from this map. And while it helps to give a general picture of the whole state, it doesn't quite give us a true glimpse at each region. Starting with East Texas, we all know that it's covered with thick piney wood forests and a lot of lakes and rivers. Although all the lakes here are man-made reservoirs, which is an interesting aspect how humans are affecting the landscape. The underlying geology is dominated by sandstone, siltstone, and lithified layers of mud. If you've tried kicking the ground around here, you'll notice that it's very soft and crumbles easily. As we move west in Texas, both the landscapes and the geology become significantly more complex. The iconic hill country, for example, is riddled with cave systems, such as natural bridge caverns. Central Texas has what's called karst topography. This means the geology is dominated by limestone rock layers. So slightly acidic rainwater or river water is able to dissolve its way through, thus forming cave systems. Every day, for millions of years, water works its way through the limestone and carves out these mysterious underworlds across central Texas. While not far away in the Llano Uplift, there's a place called Enchanted Rock. Enchanted Rock is a giant dome-like structure made of pure pink granite, which now sits exposed at the surface after having hundreds of feet, if not miles of rock, above it eroded over time. This brings us out now to far west Texas, a predominantly arid region with a landscape quite unlike any other found around the state. We've arrived at Big Bend National Park, where just the surface geology is very complex. It's a place where rocks of all ages and all types exist concurrently. Yet, even amid this sprawling landscape, humanity has also left some traces of its past.
This region of West Texas with Big Bend National Park, also called the Basin and Range Province, probably exemplifies the Texas landscape in its purest form. Like the exposed area around Enchanted Rock, we see the aftermath of many millions of years of the geologic forces at work, which they'll continue, like they've always done since the very beginning of time. But that's just the truth. It's the time factor. What Texas will look like in one million years a hundred million years, no one can predict for sure. But its landscapes will continue to change. All right, the uh, physical landscapes of Texas, and they are very varied. Again, there are four physical regions in the state of Texas, and today we are going to look at the central plains of Texas. Some of the uh, cities in the central plains of Texas include uh, Childress, Wichita Falls, and Brownwood. Of course, the Metroplex, which includes uh, Fort Worth and Dallas, uh, are the largest cities within this region. Geographers debate whether parts of the Central Plains belongs to the Great Plains and vice versa, as you can see here in the maps. You may see one map showing a larger regional landmass than you see in another. It's a matter of opinion in the academic world. Sitting on the prairie land of the Central Plains is one of the most magnificent cities in the world, Dallas, Texas. Dallas is located along the Trinity River in the southern state, Texas, with the Gulf of Mexico to the south and Oklahoma to the north. More than 6.5 million people live in the Dallas-Fort Worth-Arlington Metroplex. Hollywood films and TV shows I painted a picture of a desert city ruled by oil magnets and cattle barons. But despite its Wild West image, Dallas is not a rural city, and Texas is not all desert. Flying in, you're welcomed by the site of the Reunion Tower, the long-standing landmark of this fast-developing southern city. These days, the biggest local industry is technology, and some even call it Silicon Prairie. The more common nickname is the Big D because Dallas is so populous and the main commercial hub for the region. Explore the cultural side of Dallas by visiting the downtown theaters and galleries. Head to the Arts District and browse the Dallas Museum of Art to see American designs and famous European paintings. Next door, the Nasher Sculpture Center mixes the traditional with the contemporary in a tranquil setting. Enjoy nature's masterpieces in the Arboretum and Botanical Gardens with colorful displays of native plants and European flowers. On a hot day, order a treat from a food truck and enjoy lunch on the lawn, Texas style. Explore the underwater passages of the Dallas World Aquarium to observe remarkable creatures from up close. The aquarium is more like a zoo, so don't miss the jungle walk if you like monkeys. 
nearby. Children can fly like a bird, outrun a dinosaur, witness a tornado, or feel an earthquake at the Perot Museum of Nature and Science. At the Dallas Zoo, they can see cuddly koalas, hand feed giraffes, and admire other giants of the savannah. Visit the Six Flags Over Texas theme park in Arlington for even more family fun on the more than 100 rides. Ride the rock and rocket, roll a ball, and try a Texas-sized hot dog for lunch. Grab some boots and a 10-gallon hat and explore the Heritage Village. Then, gear up for a trip to South Fork Ranch, the film set of the immensely popular soap opera Dallas, to enter the estate where J.R. and Sue Ellen played out their unhappy marriage. After nearly four decades, this family saga is still being followed by fans all over the world. Step into the middle of a cattle drive in the heart of the city at Pioneer Plaza. See bronze statues of Texas Longhorns in the landscaped park. This recreated prairie commemorates the old cowboy trail, which brought the first settlers here in the 1800s. One of the most momentous events in American history took place in the former book depository in West End. Stand at the exact location where the shot was fired that killed John F. Kennedy in 1963. The Sixth Floor Museum at Dealey Plaza documents the assassination of this charismatic American president. Don't leave Dallas without tasting a Texas barbecue, or if you prefer fine dining, order sushi atop Reunion Tower. End your day with dancing or lounging in a cocktail bar uptown. The free vintage trolley will safely shuttle you back to downtown at night. Come to Dallas, where modern meets old, and where the friendly locals with their Texas twang will show you a welcome as big as the state. And that is the city of Dallas, quite some city. An equally great city uh, in the Central Plains is Fort Worth. Uh, it's known as Cowtown and Panther City. And that's a whole different story in itself. We'll touch on that someday. But let's uh, take a look at the city of Fort Worth. Uh, this is Sundance Square, and that is uh, the Tarrant County Courthouse, and this is Main Street. Of course, it's blocked off now, as you can see, uh, and it's a, a tourist area. It's a beautiful place at nighttime, but uh, Fort Worth is a really great city, and let's take a look at it. We are in beautiful Fort Worth, Texas. My wife is from Fort Worth, grew up, born and raised, and we met in college and came back to Fort Worth to raise our family. Fort Worth, Texas is an incredible town because there is a combination of cowboy culture, cattle drives, great museums. There's a great balance of historic fabric here, historic houses that are great to work with. It's a really interesting town. If you think about how Fort Worth started and kind of the, the industries that are around here, it's certainly cattle and oil. So the cattle guys were the original ranchers. And then, of course, in the 20s, when, when oil was discovered, they became oil rich. And so those two industries really are kind of how Fort Worth is built. We're in the stockyards, which is another incredible kind of perk of living in Fort Worth. These were the working stockyards right around the turn of the century and then the 1880s. And, you know, Fort Worth became a major hub for for cattle and cattle barons. I mean, this was a farming, ranching, you know, community. I mean, the Coliseum built in 1906, we've worked on that. Stockyards Hotel, we've worked on that. There's just so much cool history down here that, you know, we've been a part of and that just speaks about what Fort Worth is. It's, it's really cool. Fort Worth was a rough town. I mean, it was, a, it was a cowboy town. You know, there's parts of downtown that was originally called Hell's Half Acre because it was such a rough part of town. There was 
you know, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid were here. I mean, the, all the famous outlaws came through Fort Worth. But downtown Fort Worth was one of the first downtowns in the country to uh, experience revitalization through restoration. What's fun is that we've actually worked on some of these buildings down here, like the courthouse. I mean, we worked on that job four or five times. I always think it's important to hang on to our history, to remember who we are, to remember where we came from, right? I think it's important that Fort Worth, you know, re retains some of that lore because the reason you got to remember that is because it, it helps us hold on to what's important. We've got to remember that. We've got to restore that. All right. This is a big piece of wood, 20 feet long, 800 pounds. The city of Fort Worth, and it's one of my favorite towns in Texas. I think uh, San Antonio probably is my favorite city, but Fort Worth is uh, right behind it. The Central Plains is also known uh, as Tornado Alley. Uh, it is uh, prone to tornadoes, and as you can see, that uh, it it's not just uh, the North Central Plains, but also the part of the Great Plains and all the way up into the midsection of the United States. But down here in Texas, the North Central Plains are particularly uh, prone to tornadoes. And they one of the worst tornadoes in history, in fact, there were several tornadoes. It was called Terrible Tuesday, and it was April the 10th, 1979. Let's take a look at uh, that uh, outbreak. The National Severe Storms forecast has issued a tornado watch for portions of western and north central Texas and southwest Oklahoma. We got out the door as fast as we could, drove southwest, and it was drizzle and, and kind of rainy and overcast the whole time. We did not break out into sunshine until southwest of uh, Vernon. I always, always went through Vernon. That's the way I got west. And on this particular day, I was with Eddie Sims and I decided not to go through Vernon. I said, let's go south and then west. Had we gone through Vernon, we would have met the tornado head on in the fog. Vernon was hit hard. 11 people were dead. The damage was in the millions. So we went south of Vernon and then west. And I looked north and there were huge storms going up motion that I had all, uh, never seen before. And we followed it onto the Northeast, got close to Vernon and a mattress fell out of the sky. And then after that, I saw a woman standing out in a field and there was just junk littered all around her. We uh, went Southwest of Wichita Falls, Texas, and we picked up the, not the first tornado, but the second one near the town of Seymour. We were right in the damage track. Uh, I, I set up on top of a fence post and shot it. And then Eddie screamed at me until I, we left. And we cut in front of it and some mud came through the window from the outer circulation of the tornado, through the window and across inside the car. And then uh, along the side of the road, uh, a lot of storm chasers converged for Menace SL and others. We were low on gas. By that time, Eddie just wanted to quit. So we stopped and we met up with one of the other teams. And we were all carrying on about how exciting this was and so on. And finally, I said, well, you know, look off to the Northeast. And a huge white cone funnel came out the back that we could see, and then it wrapped up. There's another tornado out there, and everyone just scattered. All the power was out, so we couldn't get gas. And I, the next morning, I had to hitchhike to Lawton to get gas. We got into Wichita Falls, and the place was devastated. This whole area of town is absolutely flat. And I said, you know, I don't think we should be here. We're not going to gain anything scientific, scientifically by being here. We're, we're, we're impeding uh, the, the emergency vehicles. Let's get out as quickly as we can. One of the oddities of the tornado is that 
after it happened, you could go out in the countryside on the south side of Wichita Falls and look out across the mesquite. And there were, I, I don't know how to express this. I should have taken a picture of it. There were thousands and thousands of washers, dryers, and stoves. All these white squares, just thousands of white squares, because every house had a stove and a washer and a dryer. And they all went airborne. And then they were dropped out in this field, away from the main damage track. Did you notice uh, in the video that there was a sign uh, for gasoline uh, and uh, 68 cents for a gallon of gasoline in 1979? While we talked about the Waco Indians in our lesson yesterday, they were eventually relocated to a reservation east of Dallas in the Central Plains, and we're going to learn more about them here today. I'm half Waco and I'm half Tawakani. Uh, our people once upon a time uh, lived in this, in this region uh, along the Brazos River. Uh, we lived here approximately for many, many years before the coming of the European. Uh, we were actually moved from the particular area in the early 1850s. We were moved to a reservation called the, Bra uh, called the Brazos Reservation which is just east of uh, Dallas, Texas. Uh, from that point, I think around 1857, uh, we were moved to our present reservation area, which is in Anadarko, Oklahoma, and where we, we live today, along with the uh, Kichai tribe, uh, the Tawakani, and the Wichita proper. We share the reserve area with the Delaware and also with the Caddo tribe of Indians. Uh, the type of dwelling that the Wichita lived in was a... Uh, a dwelling called the, well, in common terms, it's called the grass house. Uh, basically, it was made um, by placing poles in the ground, very large poles, you know, uh, circumference being probably around 18 inches, and they would be placed in a, in a, in a, in a sort of a, a rectangle type shape uh, with other outer layer poles placed in, and they would bend in and, and be fixed at the top. Uh, ribs of, um, of willows would be placed around the outside to make a, a hull structure and then uh, willows or or uh, other branches would be used to make a thatched type um, uh, enclosure for, for the dwelling and we call it just a, just a grass house you know it's very intricately done and it uh, extends probably the biggest ones are about 60 foot high you know very unique you know uh, in 1541 upon European contact and after, the, after Coronado and Coronado's expedition uh, plundered the Puebloan areas in, in New Mexico, uh, there was a Wichita that was out there in the, in the area, and they asked him if, if he knew where anybody had any gold. And he said, yes. He said, my people that are on the plains of the southern plains of Kansas, at that time there was no name of Kansas, but in that region, uh, they have cities of gold. So that was one of the reasons why Coronado uh, took off on an expedition to Kansas and to meet the Wichitas because he thought their cities were made of gold. But when he got there, he only found the, the thatched roofs or thatched uh, dwellings uh, in the sunlight after everything dang dies, you know, it looks gold. You know, and that was all he found, so he made his way back to Mexico. Uh, the children, they come up, you know, and children, uh, how, how, what is the phrase, uh, there's... Um, uh, what comes out of the mouth of babes, I guess, you know, that's a phrase that most people use, you know. But, you know, children are the, are, they're inquisitive. And one of the most common things that children ask me is that, um, and they bend my ear down and say, where do you go to the bathroom? You know, and, you know, this was a very uh, question that I couldn't really uh, fully explain to them, you know. But, you know, going back to my tribal office, those kind of questions kind of, kind of play on you, you know, and um, getting with a physical anthropologist and an anthropologist, you know, that I know, you know, like Dr. Newcomb, who teaches at the University of Texas, you know, he's retired now, he lives in Austin, 
And I asked him the very same question, you know, and he said, you know, he said, that's a very interesting question because, you know, uh, your people uh, were accused early on as being cannibals. Uh, but, you know, today's forensic science, um, they look at uh, maybe uh, clay, where they might have lived in caves or stored things in caves or in the, in the bell-shaped uh, 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 storage pits in the ground or whatever, yeah. but they also look at the mitten areas, you know, and they try to find um, deposits of, um, of um, human uh, waste. Uh, if it were so that the tribe were, were cannibals, then there would be evidence of human remains in, in the mitten areas, but there is no there is no evidence of that. So what they look at also is uh, the human waste portion, and they analyze that. If there are certain kind of chemicals that are are, are are analyzed in that human waste, then it would suggest that human flesh has been eaten. And so far, um, none of that has been so. Early early accounts of my people when they were first contacted by the French and Spanish uh, people. They talked about the food products that, that were being produced uh, in, in huge, huge uh, uh, quantities about, about the Wichita, about the Wichita, the Wacos, and corn, uh, pumpkins, uh, squash, um, beans, as well as uh, the different type of um, uh, wild fruits that were, that were out. These were all in abundance. And most often they took these things and they had huge drying racks. They built them up very high, about 10 foot high, and then they would dry these items and they would use them and store them in, in, in bags and put them in the bell-shaped uh, uh, storage pits in the ground where it was cool and where they could, could stay and be used for the winter months, as well as drying all the meats and stuff that they had. Uh, the way I'm dressed today is, is more contemporary of, uh, of a native dress. Um, some of the mezcal stuff that we have here comes from this part of the part of the country. We can't get them anywhere else, you know. Uh, the different color of mezcal beans, and uh, we use those at different ceremonies. Um, of course, these are trade beads, you know, got from Czechoslovakia. Um, uh, the different broadcasts that we got were trade trade goods, you know, early on. Uh, blue and red were the favorite colors uh, that were given to the tribes, you know. Uh, of course, you know, this is a traditional um, electric fan, <laughs> you know, in, in the hot days or hot evenings, you know. They would cool themselves by using something like this. But um, this is more or less a contemporary type dress, you know. Uh, my people back then, you know, they would probably just dress in regular buckskin and it would be bare, bare chested from the top up, you know, unless they wore a buckskin shirt. Um, we bring, I bring greetings from the Wichita and affiliated tribes and the Waco people who are under the umbrella ship of the, Wich, of the Wichita people. We're very pleased to be here and to be asked to come down and to represent uh, the uh, people that was once in this particular area. Uh, and we hope we have a uh, continued friendship uh, to uh, understand each other's cultures and, uh, and other cultures that that's, has come into the area since European contact. And um, we I bring you this um, uh, from our medicine people, from our tribal government, and uh, from the uh, Wichita people who are now in Anadarko, Oklahoma. The Waco Indians, uh, part of the uh, Wichita. So that concludes our lesson on the Central Plains of Texas, and we'll look at another physical region of Texas in our lesson tomorrow.